Back when I was very young, in the fourth grade or so, a friend and I, let's call him Bob, were really adventurous and stupid, to put it in the simplest terms. My elementary school wasn't the best funded school, so we didn't have gates around it preventing trespassing. You could basically waltz your way onto the school grounds, no problem. I heard some rumors about weird things found in the cafeteria and auditorium at our school as a result of this. And I have some stories about that auditorium. Part 1. The First Trip We later found that every once in a while the custodians wouldn't lock the doors to the wings of the building where the auditorium and cafe were when they were doing their jobs. So Bob and I, being young and curious, decided to try to open the main doors, and voila, we were in. We knew that there would be staff on campus, so we were typically quiet and cautious. But we knew one place rumored to be quite odd after school hours. Reminder though, this is when we were really young, so kids like to make things up. But even if the things that they said weren't exactly true, we didn't leave unsatisfied. The cafeteria has a stage auditorium, which has a very musty storage and backstage area alongside the music room. So we ventured around and once we got backstage, things got creepy, fast. No lights were on, so Bob pulled out his phone and he turned on the camera light. Immediately, we got spooked by half-clothed metallic frames of Santa Claus during the dinner with Santa our school did. I don't know if you've ever seen a half-clothed animatronic thing, but it isn't exactly what you want to see in the dim light of a phone in a musty room. We moved on from that experience, and we didn't find anything except for a few cockroaches that I think should go extinct already, but alas, here we are. Continuing on, we looked around, and there wasn't much. But then we heard somebody walking in the hallway near the backstage entry. We hastily snuck out of the area. Part 2. A Scary Return A week or so passes by, and I go over to Bob's house. At the time, he lived right behind my house, which had a sidewalk leading almost directly to the school. I still live here, but sadly he moved away. We played on the Xbox 360 for a bit and then got a thirst for some more exploration. And luckily, once again, the doors were unlocked. This time we decided to explore a bit deeper into the area, and this is where things really got weird. We walked into the backstage area, but this time it was really humid. There was this smell of feces, and it was horrible. We covered our noses and got to the darker area with the Santa animatronic. But for some reason, he was fully clothed and facing the backstage entrance. From what I remember, it was well after December during these trips. We were weirded out by it and almost turned back. But then we heard a custodian moving his cleaning trolley in the hallway. We entered through a small stairwell that the custodian's office was adjacent to, meaning that we would have to go out the other exit. We continued on this time, and I had a small rink-eating flashlight for extra visibility. Once we were near the other stairwell, we heard a scraping sound. We turned around and that damn Santa was looking straight at us, but it was like a shadowy looking thing. The next second, it was back to facing where it was when we had entered. I didn't know if Bob saw it, but I definitely did, and it spooked the hell out of me. I told him that I saw some weird crap behind us and we decided that this was just a little too creepy, so we snuck out trying not to alert the staff of our presence. Part 3. The Near Finale For the next year or so, we weren't able to talk much because this is when he first started moving. We still hung out, but we didn't go back. So here comes December, and I have Bob and another friend, let's call him Joe, at my house for the weekend. Bob brings up the auditorium again, and by then I had almost forgotten about it. All three of us are in, but this time it's practically pitch dark, and since the week just ended, the custodians were working a bit later, allowing for some nighttime adventuring. Now, do note, the cafeteria and auditorium area had windows vertical to the stage, allowing for light to shine in during the daytime. But during later hours, they turned off the lights in the areas that weren't having anything done to them, so it was pitch dark. We head in, but this year they added in fencing near the entrances on both sides of the school, Luckily, I was a skinny fifth grader, so I stuck my skinny arm in and around the fence to open its door, which had a push bar, making it harder, but still doable. 
Now we were in, and sadly the door that leads to the main hall was locked, so we ventured around the school grounds to the library, which wasn't locked. The library had a door at the other end which led straight into the main hallway, allowing us to access what we had now coined the haunted cafeteria. I know, very creative of us. We head in, and this time we decided not to mess around and adventure the entire area. The Santa was in its performance area, and the stage curtains were closed. We ignored him and moved on. We started heading into the storage area. We looked around to see some drama club costumes. And then we smelled that same smell from a year ago. Next thing you know, the light in the room turns on, and naturally it scares us, but it was just a motion sensor light. Then, from the backstage, we hear the Santa laughing and a scraping noise, as if somebody was dragging sandpaper on the tiled ground. We think one of us did it, but we're all standing right next to each other. We go into the backstage again, and we see the Santa doing its dance. It's singing, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming. And before it even gets to the to town part, it just stops dancing and singing. Now, we don't know how the hell the custodians deal with this crap because it scares the shit out of us. And we decided to leave, many questions unanswered. Six years have passed since then, and I'm still clueless as to what the hell was going on. We haven't been there since, and I haven't seen Bob for four years. The Prologue That night, I remember walking out of the cafeteria with Bob and Jim, and I always felt like there was something watching us. It may have been paranoia, but I swear that when I turned to look behind us in the hallway with its single light on, there was a shadowy figure that was peeking on us, following us. That night, I remember seeing and hearing some weird stuff at night before I went to sleep. I remember having faint sounds in my head of that same scraping on the ground that occurred before the Santa Claus started to sing. This only happened a few times though, which eased me, but still made it weird. Every time I take a walk near that school, I always feel like something's behind me or following me, but I've never been able to find out what it is. I love haunted walks. I've been on at least six or seven that immediately come to mind. I come from a long line of, let's say, paranormally sensitive women, so I've been experiencing the unexplained my entire life. Not constantly, but often enough that, hey, it happens. So when I go on a haunted walk, Usually the people I'm with are watching me as much as they're watching the dark corners of the room. A few years ago, I used to run a hotel. It was a vintage building that had been around since the 1800s, but I'm sad to report that nothing paranormal ever happened in the hotel. Despite its age and unique history, I checked every single room of that building every single day, completely alone and I never saw any evidence of the paranormal at all. No guest ever reported anything weirder than the crappy AC not working because the owner was too cheap to replace it. Once we had a maid claim that the largest suite was haunted and she refused to ever set foot back in there, but I honestly think she just wanted to permanently get out of having to clean the biggest room we had. So, I'm sorry to say it guys, but I have zero scary stories about the hotel. The point is that I used to run a hotel, and as a hotel manager, I would often get free or discounted tickets to events and tourist attractions around the city. These tickets were meant to be used by myself and our front desk staff, so that if a guest ever asked what fun activities in the city should I make sure to see during my stay, the staff could honestly recommend places that they'd definitely been to and give them a genuine account of how they enjoyed their experience. One October, I received tickets to the haunted tour that always appears during the few weeks leading up to Halloween. My front desk manager and I were the only two who were brave enough to go. 
I had already been on several haunted walks across our country, and she had heard a few of my spooky experiences, so she was very eager to come too. Plus, we had become best friends. It was great to hang out together outside of work. We'll call her Allie. My husband, of course, came as well, as he's always my sidekick during haunted walks. The tour we decided to take included a walking tour of haunted locations in town, and finished with an internal tour of the most famously haunted house in our city, possibly in our country. To protect privacy, I won't tell you the name of the house, but we'll call it the Governor's House. The walking tour before the big event was, as always, very awesome. Very interesting stories, but since we didn't actually go into any of the reportedly haunted houses, nothing truly exceptional happened. I do remember that I had the growing urge to pee. At one point, I actually swallowed my pride and asked our tour guide if we'd be seeing any haunted coffee shops so I could pop in to use the washroom. But much to my horror, she said, Oh, sorry, no, but uh, there's a bathroom in the governor's house, and the plumbing still works, so you can use that. I don't think the caretakers will mind. With a blank stare on my face, I looked at her and hesitantly replied, uh, That's okay, I'll hold it. But by the time we got to the house, holding it wasn't an option. She gave us a brief history of the house and a retelling of the reported paranormal events. Apparently, the governor and his wife lived in the house. They ran the city, until one day, an angry mob of townsfolk broke in, ransacked the place, and murdered them both. Since then, the caretakers who used to reside in the house have experienced a lot of unexplained noises, objects moving on their own, and, worst of all, being violently shaken or slapped awake in the middle of the night but then opening their eyes to see nobody there. Needless to say, they no longer live in the house. Absolutely bursting with urgency, the first thing I did when we got into the house was lock myself in the first bathroom I saw. It was absolutely tiny, very dark, and definitely the last creepy place I wanted to be without pants on. Not to my surprise, there was no line to use it. Half jokingly, I said, Okay, ghosts, just hold off for a few minutes, let me have my privacy, and then you can do whatever you want after. I should really know better than to offer spirits a deal. When I emerged from the bathroom, everyone on the tour looked at me like I was crazy for going in there alone. Apparently, each of them would have gladly chosen to pee their pants. The guide gave us permission to walk around the house freely, as long as we were careful not to break or take anything. Allie was eager to have her first ever ghost encounter, so the first thing she did was make us go down into the basement. One of the stories that the guide told us about was a rocking chair that was known to rock on its own, so Allie was determined to find it. And, since nobody else was willing to go down into the basement, we had it completely to ourselves. Once we were downstairs, we saw three rooms, one was just a closet of mops and other cleaning supplies. To the left of it was an archway leading into a pitch black room. I thought it strange that this was the only room in the house that didn't have its lights on. And to our immediate left at the foot of the stairs was a kitchen, which also had its own archway to the dark room. We decided to explore the kitchen first since we could clearly see in there. I loved all the vintage plates, but Allie was fixated on finding a ghost and made a dash, alone, straight into the dark room. I sighed and followed behind her. The room was so dark that as soon as you entered it, you couldn't see your hand right in front of your face, which was weird because it was right next to the brightly lit kitchen through a large open doorway, but no light dripped in. You could turn around and see the entire kitchen, and you could see the faint streetlights through the window, but the actual room itself was pitch black. Not wanting to accidentally bump into and break any priceless antiques, I took out my camera and started to aimlessly snap photos, 
to get the light from the flash. It didn't occur to me until this moment that I probably should have used the flashlight app on my phone, but during creepy moments you're prone to make quick and odd decisions. Every time I snapped a photo, I got a blink into the room. It was a dining room with a large wooden table dead center, but it wasn't really the furniture that caught my eye. It was footprints. It's hard for me to really explain it, but every time I took another photo, I could see large, bright blue footprints on the floor, two at a time, making their way around the table, coming closer. After about four or five photos, I was pretty sure that I had saw what I saw, so I backed up, back into the kitchen, back into the light. My husband and Allie looked at me. I never noticed Allie pass me to go back into the kitchen. They said my face was pale, and they asked me what happened. All I said was, I'll trick him, and I dashed to the other archway that led into the dark room from the hallway, expecting to snap a photo of the full body of the entity waiting for me near the kitchen. But I was so wrong. The only one that was about to be tricked was me, because when I took that last picture and the camera flashed, all I could see was a bright blue flashing right up in my eyes, only an inch from my face. He was right there, right in front of me, and he was smarter than I was and wanted to make sure that I knew it. I stumbled back and went straight up the stairs, repeating, I'm sorry, you win. I'm sorry, you win. Allie and my husband quickly followed. Despite the weird encounter seconds earlier, we still wanted to see the rest of the house. So after I had had a chance to catch my breath and tell them what had just happened, we made our way upstairs to the bedrooms. Upstairs was uneventful. They were small rooms that were chained off to stop visitors from breaking anything. After that, we left and stood out under a streetlight out front of the house to recount our experience. While my husband and Allie chatted, I decided to take one last photo at the property, this time from outside. I didn't notice it at first, but while we were in the house, every light in the house was on, except for the dark room in the basement. But now, not two seconds later, looking into the house from the outside, it was reversed. Every light in the house was off, except for the dark room in the basement, where I could clearly see the rocking chair on the other side of the dining room table by the window. Another strange thing that happened that night was that absolutely none of the photos I took in that house were actually saved on my camera, not a single one. My husband had even worse luck, as he told me that the moment he walked into his house, his fully charged camera just completely died. A flat, empty battery the moment he crossed the threshold. But the most terrifying thing I saw that night was that picture I took from outside the house. If you had looked up to the second story window in the master bedroom, there are two distinct bright yellow eyes floating in the darkness of the house, staring directly at us down on the street below. When I showed this picture to my husband, he was so freaked out by it that he asked me to delete it immediately because he didn't want it in our house. Being sneaky, I remember saving it on Facebook before I deleted the photo from my phone so that I could share it with my friends. But after Halloween that year, I haven't been able to find that photo since. It's completely vanished and no one I know can find the copies that they saved of it either. My name is Jordan. I was a young kid of seven years old when this all started. I have an older sister by one year. I'll call her Jess. We were both being raised by my mother. She began a relationship with her boyfriend that we'll name Derek. We moved into a house in West Bountiful, Utah. The house sat near a horse farm, which sat north from the house, away from the road about 50 yards from the back door. 
The house had two wagon wheels buried into the ground halfway for decoration, sitting near the street. We had an elderly lady as a neighbor who lived to the east of us. The next house east was my friend Brian's house. The house was kind of old, but still in good shape. Walking into the front door led you into the living room. The stairs to the right led upstairs, where the bathroom was first on the left, followed by my sister's room to the right, then my mom's room on the left, and my room on the right at the very end of the hall. Past the living room was a kitchen that, to the left, led to the driveway, and to the right led downstairs to another living room. This was adapted into a place where I had my Nintendo 64 set up on a tiny TV. While going down the stairs, there was a crawl space to the right, next to the furnace. Since I was seven, I can't recall how long we lived in this house before things started becoming strange. But to my mom and sister's recollections, the first oddities we noticed was that deep into the night, the toilet would flush randomly. I never noticed this, since my room was farthest from the bathroom. But my sister and mom were both convinced that I was being mischievous and doing it. I do remember them asking me if I really needed to pee last night, but I said that I didn't know what they were talking about as I hadn't left my room. Weeks later, the toilet flushing became a common occurrence at night. I heard it happen as I was walking to the bathroom one night, so I turned around and went back to bed, obviously nervous. The next day, Derek said it had to be pressure in the sewer, causing our toilets to flush. I took his word strongly since I thought he knew all things about plumbing. But the toilet flushing started to become boring, I assume, for after a pause in the activity, the faucets in both the bathroom and the kitchen were both suddenly blasting water out of them. The knobs opened up completely. Derek sprang awake to the sound of rushing faucets and quickly shut them off. After he turned off the kitchen faucet and was walking back upstairs, the toilet flushed as he passed by the bathroom. I slept through this entire ordeal, but my mom said that it pissed him off so much he actually kicked the bathroom door. The faucets joined the toilet in becoming a common plaything at night, and all of us felt pretty uneasy about it. I'm not sure in which order the next parts of the story should go, but all of this happened in the span of about a year, six months into living in that house. My friend Brian came over, and we were playing Smash Bros on my Nintendo 64 in the basement. After several matches, he needed to use the bathroom, so he got up and ran up the stairs. I kept playing. He came running down the stairs. I thought he was excited to keep playing, but he stood there next to me, breathing heavily. His eyes were as wide as dinner plates. He stumbled over his words and asked if there was something wrong with my bathroom. Before I could say anything, he starts frantically explaining that the toilet flushed right before he got to the door, and that as he was done and was leaving, the faucet turned on full power right behind him. I told him that that's happened many times before, but only at night. Brian wanted to go back home after that. He didn't even look back as he walked down the street. I was sad. I was sure that Brian wouldn't want to hang out anymore after the house had scared him. This was, from what I recall, the first time that somebody from outside the house experienced its oddities. I told my mom about it, and she said that it was strange it had happened in the daytime. There were other times that my sister and I would stay weekends with our dad every other weekend usually. On one of these weekends, my mother and Derek were in bed. She can't recall what time at night it was, but out of her sleep, she could hear the soft sobbing of a woman. She laid there half asleep, wondering if she had left the TV on in the living room. But the sound wasn't coming from downstairs. It seemed to be coming from the room they were sleeping in. The sobbing became more pained and louder. Derek bolted awake, thinking that my mom was hurt. But then they both just sat there in silence as the sobbing turned into a cry of unimaginable pain, as if the woman was either being tortured or in pain of losing a child. 
Derek quickly got dressed, saying that the neighbor lady next door might be hurt and might need help. He ran out the front door and over to the neighbor's house, but by the time he got to her door, there was no screaming or crying. He slowly walked toward the house and the crying got louder. There was no mistake that it was coming from our house. Derek checked every square inch of the house when he got back, but there was no one in it except for him and my mother. As soon as it had appeared, it stopped. My mom says that that was one of the hardest nights sleep in her entire life. One that I was present for happened about a month after the night of the crying woman. It is, of course, the dead of night, and we're all sleeping in our rooms. Suddenly, my mom and Derek were awoken by a blinding light, as bright as a lighthouse. My mother and Derek sprang up and tried to find the light switch in the house, but as they flipped it on, the light stayed. Derek thought it was a semi-truck shining its brights through their window, but as he opened the window, he realized that their window faced the horse farm. They had no window facing the streets at all. As soon as he spun back around from looking outside, the light died out. I remember the commotion afterward. Derek was running all over the house in a panic. He checked the fuse box, grabbed his tools, and tore apart their light fixture at 3 a.m., trying to find any logical explanation and shouting in frustration the entire time. My mother would stay up late most nights. She loved her horror movies and crime shows, so she'd watch them while we were asleep. It wasn't far from midnight when my mom heard the voices of children giggling. The only light on in the house was the TV. She assumed that my sister and I were trying to scare her. So she pointed at the stairs and said, both of you go to bed now. The giggling continued for a little longer before my mom stood up and marched up the stairs, but no one was there. The giggling, though, was getting louder. She finished climbing the stairs and opened my sister's door, only to find her fast asleep in her bed. She checked into my room and found me the same way. After she went down the stairs again, the giggling finally stopped. My mom claims that afterward, she sat there and thought of the woman crying for a while before this occurrence, and thought that these children giggling had some morbid connection. My mom caught the elderly neighbor one morning in her driveway and asked if she knew anything about our house. The lady said she lived on that street for half of her life and never heard or saw anything bad happen inside of the home. Just families moving in and out over the years. We never looked further into this theory. The time passes and we now refer to our ghostly friends as the kids and the lady. The kids loved to play around in mine and my sister's rooms. They'd open and close our closets, slam my sister's hope chest to startle us, and still loved to play with the toilet at night. Of course, now being eight years old, I had a constant uneasy feeling in that house. My mother would assure me that our ghosts were a happy family that needed a place to stay, but this didn't settle my fears at all. I had grown accustomed to having multiple light sources in my room, a lava lamp, two plasma balls, and a fiber optic light. All of them were on the headboard of my bed, and I needed these on at all times to feel comfortable enough to sleep. When they were on, I never had anything bad happen in that room. My mom and Derek understood that I needed them on, and never touched them while I slept. But from time to time, I would wake up and find that some, if not all of my lights had been switched off. Not just the power strip they were plugged into, but the little manual clicky knobs on the wires themselves had been turned off. I'd usually wake up late into the night to pitch darkness and scramble out of fear to get all of my lights back up and working. One night, after turning them all back on, I noticed the closet door which had been closed when I went to sleep. It was wide open, but that was all. The next part is rather hard for me. Even as I tell this story now, I have goosebumps all over. I had a very gruesome dream, 
that I could only describe as a horror that no young boy could ever dream of on his own. I was sitting in a room in the house in dress clothes, and I was crying. Loud bangs to the door of the room, and a hellish scream echoed through the empty room, and I huddled into a corner and screamed. The room went dark with a shadow as the door opened. I couldn't see what was in the doorway, but I kept screaming for whatever it was to stay away. Silence fell. For what seemed like an hour, I sat there in the corner, staring at the blackness of the door. Suddenly, people came walking through the shadows. They were all of my family, from my mom and dad to my sister and even a couple of cousins. I didn't leave the corner to greet them. They all just stood there, staring at me with pale faces and glazed eyes. My sister smiled eerily at me and would take stiff steps toward me. I would scream and she would step back and giggle. My dad walked up to me, towering over me. As he knelt down to my level, his eyes went from glazed and dull to being a void of darkness with small glints of light for pupils. I cowered in fear, turning my head from him. He then grabbed the top of my head and forced me to stare him in the face. Then he said, you have to say your goodbyes or they're going to be lonely in heaven. Jess screamed in a shrieking voice as my dad grabbed me by my ankle and held me upside down. I was equal height to his face now, and I could see all of the faces of my relatives at that moment. They all had the same eyes as my dad, but had gaping and bleeding mouths, almost like their jaws had been nearly torn off. They all chanted the word, heaven, over and over as they carried me into a living room where a bed was set up. In the bed was a corpse. It was my sister. Still held by the ankle, they held me above her corpse. I remember every detail of her face. Her skin was olive green and white. It was cracking in places, and her eyes were cold and cloudy and lifeless. I stared at her face in shock and disbelief. One of her eyes moved and stared back at me, before she suddenly sprang from the bed and wrapped her arms around me, pulling me into the bed. She screamed and shrieked as she wrapped her rotting fingers around my neck and began to choke me. I screamed with my last breath for somebody to come to my rescue, but at the last moment I saw my sister placing her thumbs over my eyes and pressing in. I felt the pain of my eyes popping and all I could do was scream. I was suddenly woken by my mother. I was apparently shouting in my sleep and flailing uncontrollably for several minutes before she got me to open my eyes. Not to my surprise, my lights were all off. I could barely see my mom's face as she held my head in her arms. I was in complete shock. I was shaking violently, unable to speak, darting my gaze over every inch of the room, looking for the demons that nearly had me. I struggled to grab my mom's arm and stuttered, asking where Jess was. At that moment, Jess, who had been awoken by the noise I was making, flipped on the light as she walked in. Upon seeing her, I broke into a nervous breakdown. I tried to crawl away from her, still choking on absolute terror and unable to scream. I grunted and wheezed at her, tears pouring down my face like a waterfall. My mom told Jess to go back to bed. Jess left the room, and my mom asked me if I wanted to stay the night in her bed. I couldn't answer. I was still in shock. She picked me up out of the bed and took me into her room and put me in the spot next to her. She threw blankets over me and said to try to get some sleep. I laid there, shaking like a leaf, the dream playing on repeat through my head as I trembled. Not even being near my mom made me feel safe at that point. I remember being like that for hours afterward. The exhaustion finally caught up to me, and I fell asleep once again. My mother says that when she looked at me the next morning, she noticed that I had slept through the remainder of the night, with my eyes open. I woke up a couple of hours later in a haze. My entire body felt heavy and weak. 
I made my way downstairs to where my mom and sister were. They asked me what I dreamt about. It all flooded into my head again, and I started crying hysterically. It would be several years later when I finally told them what the dream had been about. My mother called my school and let me stay home that day. She asked if I was hungry, but food was the last thing on my mind. She led me to my room and said I should have a nap since it's daytime and things will be more peaceful. I laid in my bed under the covers and wept. A chill ran through my spine and I stopped crying. Listening carefully, I could hear the whisper of a child. Shh, don't worry, it'll be okay. I laid there frozen. I slowly pulled the blanket from over my eyes, only to witness my closet door slowly closing itself. I stared at it quietly for some time before hopping out of bed and running down to the living room. I didn't tell my mom about the closet or the whisper. I knew she would just blame them on the dream I'd had. So I kept that one a secret for a couple of years. My mother believes me now though now that I've told her everything while we were sharing our experiences. Weeks later, my Aunt Dana stayed with us for a week. It was a weekend where we were going to my dad's house. My mom and aunt were alone in the house while Derek was at work. My mom was watching General Hospital and my aunt was using the shower. My aunt came running down the stairs out of nowhere, pale as a ghost. She asked my mom if she had walked into the bathroom a moment ago. My mom said no, of course not. My aunt described looking through the foggy shower door and seeing a woman with blonde hair in the bathroom staring at the mirror. My mother has brown hair. She then turned and walked out without making a sound or speaking a word. My aunt stared back up at the bathroom and said, there's something very wrong with this house. She's not the only one who's ever said those words. I got my friend Brian to stay the night at my house with the promise of late night gaming. He remembers the incident from before and asked how it was living in a haunted house. I said it's not all that bad, jokingly, of course. I didn't tell Brian about any of my personal stories in fear that he might end our friendship over it. The night hit about 11 p.m. and we switched from games to cartoons. We both fell asleep with the glow of my tiny TV upon us. Everything was fine until I was shaken awake by Brian. He was hysterical. He grabbed me and pulled me close and said, I hear them. They giggle at me when I'm sleeping. There's something wrong with this house. I want to go home. Please let me go home. His scream woke up my mom and she ran down the stairs to find Brian hyperventilating. She grabbed all of his belongings and walked him out of the house after he calmed down and down the street to his own house. She came back and said that Brian's dad didn't want his son to come over anymore just to get scared to death. I don't really blame him. He still came over sometimes, but he never stayed the night again, and he especially avoided the basement from that time on. There were a couple more parts to the story, but they played out in similar fashion to most of the other activity. My mom's relationship with Derek came to an end, and we were packing up stuff to move to a different city. After all of our belongings were removed, we walked slowly through parts of the house, talking about our stories of creepy happenings. My sister and I, feeling a bit brave due to us leaving and never coming back, had a surge of courage to ask the kids if they liked playing with us. It was dead silent in the house. My sister and I giggled to each other and said they probably hated playing with us because we were annoying. My mom says she felt something a bit different, almost like there were a couple of people who were sad to see us go. Derek also felt the same vibe. But after two years in the house in West Bountiful, we left. My mom and I still bring up the stories from time to time. We both get goosebumps from the blinding light story and she's blown away by how terrible my dream was. I recently revisited that dream a month ago, not to my choosing, of course. Played out the exact same as that night when I was eight years old. Only this time I woke up calmly and shook it off. It was after that dream that I decided to write about what I can only describe as a ghost story. 
It may appear as fiction to many, but to us, it was a living reality. It saddens me that we didn't do more research into the house to see if there was ever a problem or a tragedy there. I don't live far from there currently, but there's a good chance that the house and many others were demolished in a housing project. Either way, I feel it's best left as it is. A creepy story. I'm 26 now, and I have a love of horror movies and creepy places. Maybe my exposure to these terrifying events flipped a couple of adrenaline switches in my head. I still don't have a definite answer as to whether ghosts really do exist, but I can't deny what we went through in the West Bountiful House. This all took place six years ago when I was 14. The backstory of this house is quite odd. The official report of the incident that took place here was coincidentally lost. I know that sounds fake and unreal, but I swear on my life that it's true. Nobody has found the incident report. Although the story of the house was known by most kids, grandparents, and parents who lived near the house at the time the incident occurred back in the late 80s and early 90s, no official report can be uncovered. The house was occupied by a family of four. The father of the household took the lives of his two children and his wife as they slept, and then he himself went into the basement and took his own life. The neighbor immediately reported the incident after hearing a gunshot from the house. The cops arrived, asked questions, took statements, and removed the bodies. Some of the residents who used to live in the area told the cops that the father of the family wasn't a violent man, and that he wouldn't go and kill his family like he did, and that he must have been possessed. From then up until the day that the building was torn down, after my visit of course, it was reported to be very haunted. My friend, let's call him Mike, invited me over for a sleepover at his parents' rental, which was this house. At the time, I loved ghosts and the paranormal, but he didn't tell me that the house was haunted until I arrived at the house. I was a bit skeptical, but his parents backed him up with the backstory that I had just told you. I arrived at his house and he had everything packed up, from his Xbox 360 to snacks and drinks. All I had was my backpack full of games and my go-to box from the Waffle House, which contained two chocolate chip waffles. We started to head down to the rental, which was in the same neighborhood as Mike's house. We arrived at around three in the afternoon. The house looked quite nice in its simple layout with a separated two-car garage. Just to give you a feel and an insight of the house's layout, when you walk in the front door, immediately to your left was the living room. Behind that was the kitchen. Next to the kitchen, across from where the front door was in the foyer, was the dining room. And behind the dining room was the back door to the back porch. As you walk toward the dining room, the hallway was to your right. On the left of that hallway is first the door to the basement. Next to it is a small closet and next to that was the first bedroom, across from which was the second bedroom and to your immediate right in the hallway was the full hall bathroom. The master bedroom was located directly in the back. When you enter the master bedroom, the bathroom is on your immediate right. To the left of the bathroom is a medium walk-in closet. Across from where you're standing is the bed against the wall with no footboard. We walk in, Mike set up his Xbox and I put all the food in the fridge. We immediately started playing video games after we got the system up and running. After about an hour or so, there was no paranormal activity whatsoever. I eventually got up to go get my waffles because I was tired of Doritos. When I opened the fridge, I noticed that my to-go box was open and that one of the waffles was missing. I knew that Mike couldn't have been the one that took it because he'd been in the living room with me the entire time. So I grabbed the to-go box and brought it back into the living room. I told him what I encountered and he thought it was kind of odd. But then he joked, saying, maybe the ghost wanted some real food. After about 20 minutes of more video games, we hear a door slam shut. We just looked at each other for a minute. 
and Mike told me to stop smiling so much because it looked creepy, but I was excited to finally catch some paranormal activity. Mike told me to go check on it, and without much hesitation, I did. I slowly walked down the hall, checking each room, nothing out of the ordinary. When I reached the master bedroom, nothing was out of place, nothing on the bed. I then heard the water running, which I didn't hear when I entered the room, and the door to the bathroom was open, not closed. The same was with the closet door as well, so I couldn't figure out what had slammed shut. I called Mike in to show him the running water. We entered the bathroom, turned the water off, and started looking around to see if anything had fallen or was out of place, but nothing was out of the ordinary. It wasn't until we started to leave when Mike stopped dead in his tracks. I asked him what was wrong, and all he did was point to the bed. I kid you not, the waffle that had disappeared was on the bottom right corner of the bed on a styrofoam plate. I told Mike to go to the end of the hall and asked if he could see it, and he said that he could. But he swears up and down when he walked into the room to check out my find, he didn't see it on the bed, and I hadn't seen it either. He told me that if it was on the bed, you could have seen it as clear as day. We both thought it was spooky, but personally, I loved it. We returned to the living room and played some more while discussing what we'd seen. After about 40 minutes, we get the jump of our lives. All of the cupboards and drawers in the kitchen opened and slammed simultaneously. We both jumped out of our skin. I went to check it out, but it was just crazy to think that all the cupboards and all the drawers opened and slammed at the same time. A few minutes later, we hear a small clang coming from the basement. We both ruled out the heater since it was midsummer, and the AC because the AC was already on. It was at this point that Mike decided to bounce because he was officially creeped out. I, on the other hand, decided to stay for the rest of the night. He let me keep the Xbox with me so I would have something to do. About 20 minutes later, Mike calls me. I put him on speakerphone so I could play my game. He asked if anything had happened since he left. And as soon as I said no, a loud bang came from the basement. It sounded like somebody took a crowbar and hit a barrel with it. I immediately rushed to the basement door. I am a bit hesitant at first, but I open the door and flick on the light and run down the stairs with my phone. Mike is dead silent on the other end, and then he breaks his silence as I'm searching for the source of the bang. He asks if there's anything down there, and I told him no. The basement is finished and it's quite big and fully furnished. I see and hear nothing, so I go to leave. I was halfway up the stairs when I hear what sounds like a man moaning in pain at the bottom of the steps. I take off up the steps and slam the door and lock it. I asked Mike if he had heard it on his end and he said he did, and that truly scared the crap out of me. I reluctantly regained my composure and told Mike that I was still going to stay the night. He told me I was crazy for wanting to stay. The true reason I stayed was because I had always wanted to be a paranormal investigator and this was my chance to prove myself. I ended up staying the whole night, playing video games. The paranormal activity did not stop. It was frequent. Every few minutes I would hear one of the doors slam or one of the sinks would start running. At one point, all of the doors shut at once, except for the basement, front, and back door, of course, since they were already closed. The second creepy incident was when I heard the shower in the master bedroom come on. I went to check it out and turned it off. By this point, I was more annoyed than intrigued, because the only thing these ghosts seemed to want to do was mess with me. So anyway, I'm leaving the bathroom, and I scan the master bedroom for anything out of place. And sure enough, I see it. It was small at first, but then it got bigger. It was on the bed. It looked like someone or something was sitting on the edge of the bed, and then started to lay on the bed, but nothing was visible except for the large indent that they were making. I quickly called Mike and told him what I saw. He flipped out and told me I should leave. I told him to relax and said that I was going to be fine. For the rest of the night, the door slamming continued, 
along with random drawers and cabinets being opened when I knew they were closed. Also, water was running from random sinks, like I said, and those ghostly things went as far as to dump the trash all over the kitchen. Unnecessary. Finally, the sun came up, and I hadn't even gotten a single moment of sleep. I packed up and went to Mike's house and told his parents that I had to keep the house tidy because the ghost really loved trashing the place. This part is the third creepiest thing that happened. When I got back to my house, Mike called me. He sounded completely frantic. I told him to calm down and just tell me what was wrong. He said a little bit after I left his house, his parents went back with him to the rental. He and his parents entered the house, only to see that the entire thing was upside down. The furniture was flipped over. The kitchen was a disaster, with water running. Utensils were on the floor. Silverware was everywhere. Trash was on the floor, as well as the contents of the fridge. But there was no sign of forced entry or a break-in. And I know that I made sure all the doors and windows were locked before I left. The fourth incident is the one that really made me crap myself. Mike told me that when they opened the basement door, the inside of the door had long, large, deep scratches carved into it. Obviously, this scared me and my friend because whatever did that to the door could probably have done that to me while I was in the basement the night before if it really wanted to. The house was demolished a year later and the ground it stood on was blessed by a local Catholic priest. A new home stands there now, but nobody has ever witnessed anything paranormal yet. I would like to share a personal experience that I had in my childhood home in the early 90s when I was six years old. This isn't the first experience, and it definitely wasn't the last, but it's the only time that I ever truly saw her. A quick backstory. The house is a brick colonial, built by one of the very first families to settle outside of Philadelphia. They were a very affluent family who owned a large portion of land in the area and worked in the city. The house was lived in by their descendants well into the early 1900s. So, as you can imagine, a lot of history, births, deaths, and such were going on within those walls. As a child, I suffered from nightmares, a lot of them. It was commonplace for me to wake up in the middle of the night, jarred awake by some terrifying dream and this time it was no different. On this particular night, I had awoken from a scary dream, and in order to calm myself down, I laid quietly in my bed and scanned the dark corners of my bedroom for some unknown threat. I have no idea what I expected to find, but I definitely remember the feeling of what could be hiding here in the shadows. As I looked around, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary at first, but then all of a sudden, there she was, standing in my doorway, staring directly at me. Her face was emotionless. She was very beautiful, with shoulder-length brown hair that had large waves toward the bottom, and she was wearing a long white nightgown. Forgive me for the cliché, but that's what she was wearing. I stared at her in shock and confusion, and she just stared back. I didn't understand what was happening, but what I did know was that there was a woman in my house in the middle of the night that I didn't recognize, and she was looking directly into my eyes. She was clear as day, as if somebody was just standing there, watching over their child as they slept. The wheels in my head were turning, and all I could come up with was, this person should not be here. The next thing I remember doing was throwing the covers over my head, as you do, with my heart racing, and thinking over and over, please go away, please go away. I have no idea how long I hid under the covers, but when I emerged, she was gone. From what my mother tells me, I didn't tell her right away what had happened. I think she said that I told her a couple of days later that I saw a woman in the house. From that point onwards, even to this day, when I visit my parents who still live there, you had better bet that that door is shut. Friends ask me how on earth I could live there, 
The way I see it, her presence has never been malicious, and she lived there first, so it's just as much her house as it is mine if she chooses to stay. She does seem to have a sense of humor, though. I thought about saving that story for a different day, but it does directly correlate to the original, so I will add it here. Fast forward to last summer. I was back home for a short time helping to run the family business, which is also on the same property but in a separate building. The topic of hauntings came up with one of the employees that I had grown close with. I told her that we have a resident ghost in the family home, and told her the story that I just told you. She jokingly said to remind her never to come to visit. I reassured her that it wasn't that bad, and that I personally hadn't experienced anything recently when I visit. I even made a joke that perhaps she had moved out. We laughed, and that was the end of it. Or so I thought. That very same evening, I came downstairs to ask my mother something, and found that I was alone in the house. The property is pretty large, so it's not uncommon to be around and not know where somebody is. I went into the kitchen and found some almonds to snack on. Just then, I felt like someone was in the house with me. I figured it was my mom coming back, and I checked around the corner, but there was no one there. I called out to her and received no response. It was strange, but I shrugged it off and went back to snacking. I had my back to the entrance to the kitchen, and I was just sort of standing there staring out the kitchen window and daydreaming. That is when I felt it. Someone poked me on the back of my arm. It was a playful poke, the kind you do when you sneak up behind someone and tap them to get their attention. In the time it took me to turn to see who was there, I remember wondering who it could possibly be. My parents really are not the type to sneak up behind you and poke you. It was no one. No one was there. I fully expected someone to be standing there, so when there wasn't, I was so taken aback that I let out a startled yell. I power walked straight for the front door and left the house. The feeling I had was like reality slapped me in the face. I'm completely convinced that it was her giving me a playful nudge, saying, I didn't move out, guess who's still here? That really freaked me out. I can handle little things here and there, but being physically touched? No thank you. Anyway, that's all, I just wanted to share my story. So this happened around seven years ago, in 2012 or 2013. I started high school, and the place I attended was in a different city from my hometown, so I stayed in the school's dorm. The place was on the outskirts of the city. It was a large area with two school buildings, two separated PE buildings, a study hall, a kitchen and cafeteria, and the dorm. It was a custom for freshmen to stay in the big bedrooms, the ones that could host up to 12 people. In the room that I was staying in, there were only seven girls, including me, throughout the whole year. Seven is a bad number in my country, similar to how some people don't like 13. Through the school year, we experienced really weird things happening. Every month, we gathered a handful of screws that weren't missing from anywhere. We found weird candy wrappings, old-style ones that nobody had had in the room. Once, three of us had to go home during the week because all of us had had some sort of accident. One time, our lock broke, which locked half of the group out and the other half in. The room was separated into three sections, and all three had double windows. One time, the middle inside window broke during the day, and there were just a lot of other small things that happened. We usually joked about them, even though we were all a bit uneasy, because they were happening so often. And because they were so frequent, we just shrugged them off. Then, the scariest thing happened. It was March 13th. I remember this vividly, because we have a national holiday on the 15th, and that meant a long weekend. One of my roommates was a sleep talker and she usually fell asleep before everyone. 
We had a habit of making fun of her a bit because it was always gibberish to us. Well, not that night. She fell asleep pretty early and talked about her boyfriend in her sleep. We silently laughed at her and after a while, the others went to bed. Three other girls and I were sleeping in the last section, far from the door. We pushed together three beds and slept cuddled up most of the night. I was sleeping on one end of the beds and the sleep-talking girl, Henriette, on the other end. There were two other girls between us, Yvette and Ata. I almost fell asleep when Ata let out a small scream next to me. I quickly sat up and saw that Henny was pulling Yvette's ponytail and was choking her. We quickly get her hands off of Yvette and cuddled up on the bed, trying to stay away from her while calling her name, hoping that she would wake but she didn't. Then she started to talk to us about, quote, the people who were locked up in the attic. She was talking about how they were free now and they were getting closer. She told us that these people would kill us all. By that time, everyone in the room was freaking out. The girls in front kept telling her to cut it out, but the people in the back where I was, we feared for our lives. I'm not a religious person anymore, but I was back then. So at one point, I started to quietly pray, hugging the two sobbing girls. I didn't even say two lines when Henny said in a menacing voice, don't pray, that won't help you. One of the girls in the front screamed and turned the light on. It took us five minutes at least to wake up Henny and when she woke up, she seemed terrified and started to cry and kept asking us what had happened. I left that school at the end of the school year, but that night still haunts me.